surface we're going to look at is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. Combine two things that are confusing. We'll do that right now. So the equation for this will be y over b squared minus x over a squared equals z over c not squared. And you need to make sure, uh, in this case, c needs to be positive. Obviously, a and b better not be 0, or you're going to have some trouble. But we are assuming c is positive. Generally, a and b should be positive as well. So if you graph this out, you get a saddle. So there'll be a, oh, I could do a better parabola. There we go. And and I'll use a different color for the uh, curve. So the curve I drew is on the, I better label axes. So we will have one axis coming out. It's going to be x, y to the right, and z is up. So I'm going to draw the curves that are uh, orthogonal to the y axis now. So these curves are coming out of the board or going back into the board. So it's supposed to look like a saddle. Oh, now these keep going down forever. So it's supposed to form a basically a saddle shape. Like a horse saddle type of thing? Yep. Okay. Or a unicorn saddle. <laughs> They're probably the same saddle. So there are some more graphs in table 12.1. But trying to draw all these graphs out is pretty useless unless you're going to graph on uh, basically a computer using some three-dimensional graphing program. Then it can be a lot more worthwhile. So we're going to get into the next chapter now. So we're going to get back to doing some calculus. So geometry is behind us now. So 13.1, we're going to look at curves in space. And these curves are going to represent motion. So these are going to be particles moving around in space. And what do you get if you take derivative of position? Velocity. So that's the first thing we'll look at is velocity. So we'll have some curve representing position, and derivative of that will tell us velocity at each point on the curve. So I've probably defined a curve before, but just in case, we'll define it again now. So curve in Rn is a function from, we'll use an uh, interval. So i is going to be an interval, and it's a subset of the real numbers. So where i is an interval, generally it will not be all real numbers. It'll usually be uh, zero seconds to some reasonable number of seconds, like zero to eight, something like that. 
So it, it'll be a time interval. And our curve, we'll use the letter R. So it'll be R of T. And there'll be, if we're in three dimensions, it'll look like X of T, Y of T, Z of T. So that's in R3. Of course, if you're in Rn, so generally in Rn, we can't use x, y, z because we run out of letters when you pass 3. So we'll go R of t, we'll go with x1 of t, x2 of t, etc., xn of t. So there'll be n component functions. One for each dimension. So that was our R3. You could, of course, write it as, if you're in three dimensions, you can write it as x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k. So if you have i, j, k notation, you pretty much write the same thing with the i, j, k placeholder. Well, let's do our first example. Now there is one type of curve we've already extensively used in this course. What type of curve have we looked at quite a bit? Tangent curve. Lines. Lines. They're not terribly exciting. Each function, x, y, z, each of these individual functions are linear functions. So they look like uh, a, t plus b, something like that. Sometimes I wrote it b plus a, t. But we have looked at curves. They've just all been lines so far. So they're a little bit boring. So we're going to look at curves that, are, uh, that actually curve, don't just go straight. So let's describe this curve here. R of t equals cos t sine t t. What dimension is this curve going to live in? Three. So this will be three dimensions. And this will be all t, let's go uh, 0 to 4 pi. So I've told you graphing these is pretty useless. So let's graph it. <laughs> let's be smart about it. Let's just do, so if you look at this curve, there is a trig component and a linear component. Obviously, it's in three dimensions, so we have to consider them all together. But what's happening in the xy plane is very different than what's happening in the z-axis. So let's think if we just had two dimensions, if you ignore that third parameter, what are we looking at here if we don't care about z-coordinates? We're looking at a circle. So if I just looked at the first xy coordinates, so let's make an easier problem right here. Uh, let's go with, we'll do alpha of t. So let alpha of t equal just the cos t sine t. And if we graph this out, there's no z-axis now. I got rid of the z-axis. How do you graph things if you're not sure how they're going to graph? Clueless method. Clueless method. Plot points. Good news, you should have a pretty good idea of what this is going to look like. What is your typical x-coordinate in trig? It's usually cosine t or cosine theta. So that's the regular x coordinate, the regular y coordinate that we're expecting. So it should rotate the usual way. So if they were switched or if one of them was negative, I'd have to be very careful about where it starts. I can always plot points, t equals 0. I got cos 0, sine 0, which is 0, 1. So my t equals 0 points right here. And that's a radius 1. And t equals pi over 2. That brings me to the top right here. And I'll have a y-coordinate of 1 now. And hopefully this will be enough to convince you
that we are just rotating around and around unit circle. Twice. Twice, if we yeah, if we're careful about it, we're going around twice. Starting, we are starting and ending at the point on the right. So that's t equals zero. It's also t equals two pi and four pi. So this is an overhead view. That's one way to think about it, where the z-axis is going straight out of the board. So you can think of this as looking at down from really high up. You're just going to see a circle. Uh, another nice math word or a way to describe this is a projection. So if you project it down to the ground, down to the xy plane, this is what you would see. So you took all the z-axis and smashed it down. That's what a projection is. So that's the overhead view, or the projection, if you ignore the z-coordinate. Now, let's think about the three-dimensional version. Would it be a cylinder? Almost a cylinder. It'll live in a cylinder. This curve will, could be drawn on a cylinder. So we are forming a circle in the xy-coordinates. What is happening in the z-coordinate as t increases? So the way I drew our circle, I drew it as t is increasing. We're spiraling. Oh, I said it. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> oh, we're spiraling. Good idea. <laughs> uh, so we're rotating on the XY, XY plane as we increase our Z coordinate. So that means we're spiraling upwards. So it's like a spring. It's just like a spring. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's a spring that just goes around twice. And you have to decide. You have to get the rotation correct, because there's two ways to kind of spiral up if you just see a spring. Uh, so it's going to be a spiral. And we'll do our best to graph this out. So before I graph it out, I'm going to graph a shadow, which is that unit circle. Oh, oh we got gray already. Good. So here's my shadow. That's pretty decent. So that's the shadow. That would be if we were looking down from far above, that's what we would see if we projected it downwards. So we'd see that shadow. And now we're going to carefully draw the spiral. And I'll do that in blue. Where is the first point, the t equals 0 point? In the xy plane. It'll be in the xy plane. So if I figure out r of 0, I have cos 0, sine 0, and then the last coordinate is 0. So cos 0, we got 1, 0, 0. So our first point is 1, 0, 0. Oops. It's a little tricky. Your x-axis is the one drawn out, coming out of the board. So our first point is right there on the positive x-axis. So any questions getting the first point drawn in our, we are doing this in the clueless method, basically. We're a little less clueless because we know the circle's going on, but we're basically going plotting points. What is the next good t value you can think of? Pi over 2 is pretty solid. I could do pi over 6 or pi over 3, but let's just go right to pi over 2. So figure out r of pi over 2, and then do your best to plot that point. And be careful, it may not be exactly where you think. So your point should be above the y equals 1 on the, x, on the y axis, and it should be about 1 and a half above, because that's close to pi over 
So I did my best to draw right above this uh, on that y-axis. I tried to go up pi over 2. So that's what I drew right here. And these are connected together, and it's going to spiral. This is one of the reasons I drew that shadow. So try to draw the part of the curve that would cause that shadow right there. So it's not quite. It looks something like that. I think we'll change our mind about the way it's drawn in a minute when we draw a couple, put a couple more points on. So what's another good point to draw? Two what? Pi. Two pi is good. So two pi, I would be up above my original point, uh, two pi vertically, which is close to six. So I think that's way up there. So that'll be one full spiral rotation. Try to plot a few more points. That back point is going to be really hard to plot, so I should be going up about three from the back. Oh man, we'll do our best here. So there's a radius of one right there, and I'm trying to go up about pi, which is somewhere right about there. But this is where it starts to get really shady because it looks like. I'm almost right above that point I just drew, but I'm actually behind it and to the left going and to, above it. <laughs> going through this graph, when we just double, we have put that for those points above. So that's t equals pi over two. So this that's is one rotation. We need one more. Yeah. Well, we kind of jumped ahead and did the two pi point without the the points on the way. So I'm just filling in those points on the way. So now we'll do the uh, 3 pi over 2, which is on the negative y-axis. So we're going to go starting at negative 1. And now I need to go up 3 and a half pi, so 4 or 5 or so. We're going to go up. Five. So maybe you're right about, oh, it should be a little more to the right, right about there. So you better be a good artist if you're going to have a good spiral going up between these four points connected in the right order. So do your best now. I don't know if I'm smart enough to draw the spiral. My last point should be lower. My brain wants to draw some type of a, I think it has a sharp turn in the, with a perspective, something like that. All right, so I'm not good at drawing spirals. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tricky, especially in that area right there. So that hopefully is somewhat convincing that's one spiral on the way up. Can't quite call it a period because our z coordinate is changing, but in terms of the xy coordinates, this would be one period. Now there'd be one more spiral on top of this, so if you drew that one in, I want to keep it blue. So it looks something like that. It would be our second spiral. Feel free to draw these way better if you can. Or just uh, find a spring <laughs> and <laughs> hold it at the right angle is probably the best thing to do. All right, so that should convince you drawing, trying to graph in three dimensions is difficult, even something relatively easy like a spiral. So we're going to, what's the first thing we do in calculus class? Calculus one. There we go. So before we do derivatives, we're going to do limits. Can you take Louis Pitel's rule, too? Then we have to. We'll use Louis Pitel's rule. <laughs> so let's write down the definition of a limit. So we'll write our old definition. 
we had a function of x, and we had x approaching a number. And we wrote lim x approach, uh, not 0, x approach a f of x equals l. So that was just a general way to write a limit out. And we'll write the definition now. Any epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if x minus a less than delta, then fx minus l less than epsilon. So you may have forgotten the definition, but hopefully that's a little familiar. So let's bring this into uh, curves. Let's think about inputs and outputs on curves. So first of all, what input variable are we using? We're using t. So we'll have t approaches. I could just use a. That'll work. I think the book might go with t naught, but we'll just go with a to keep it similar. Uh, our curve, what letter did I use? r. I think I used r. r of t equals, and we'll keep using the same letters. So first of all, what type of an object is L. Is it a number or a vector? What do you get out of this R function? You, the inputs are numbers. You just look at the definition of R. You're going to get a vector out. So that means L is a vector now. All right, so that is a big difference right there. So L is a vector, not a number anymore. Let's do our best to write out the definition now. I'm going to write there exists as the backwards E. We're in Calc 3, so we'll use all the shortcuts that I know of. So any, oh, let's go crazy. Any, we have a short word for that, upside down a. So that says any epsilon greater than zero, there exists. So turn a upside down and e backwards. And that's what it means. Don't turn a backwards and e upside down or you won't get anywhere. Because <laughs> of symmetry. All right, so there exists a delta greater than zero such that, ooh, such that. We got something for that too. <laughs> you use colon for that. Or ST, S period, T period, that's another abbreviation. We're gonna go with colon. All right, such that, I'm just copying and pasting. If I have to change my letters here, my input is T minus A less than delta then r of t is replacing f of x, r of t minus l less than epsilon. Oh, why are we doing if then? Let's get crazy. <laughs> what can I use instead of if then? If else. So we go to double arrow. So a implies b. So that is as compact as you can write it. It's a sentence, so there's a period at the end, obviously. Good news is 
this definition completely holds. I don't have to change anything. So I did change notation a little bit. The main thing that changed, this right here, is one vector minus another vector. So what does that mean, the absolute values? What operation do the absolute values correspond to? Magnitude. So it's written the same way, but this is now magnitude. That's the only difference. So this is a magnitude of obviously a vector. So your definition is pretty much unchanged. The only difference is you have a magnitude over there. So this can be a little tricky to think about. So I'm just going to draw a random curve right here. This will be R of t curve. This point will be uh, t equals a. So if our curve is continuous, then there's no holes in it, and it can be drawn out like this. So let's think about what does it mean to be close to L right here. What does it mean to be close to L? Close to the vector. Uh oh. So that right there corresponds to t equals a. So this point L will be uh, r of a, assuming our function is continuous. So what does it mean to be close to L in higher dimensions? What does it mean to be epsilon close to L? Infinitely close to L from all directions. Yeah. That, well, yeah, so when we take the limit, it'll be infinitely close. Absolutely. I have a question about yeah. the uh, formula of the uh, absolute value of t minus a is that a magnitude as well? Oh, that's a good question. What type of mathematical objects are T and A? Scalars. Anybody can answer the questions. Scalars. Oh, that's the answer. Okay. So it's absolute value. Later on, our inputs are going to be m-dimensional. Our outputs will be n-dimensional. So later on, these are both going to be vectors. But for now, it's still a number. So our inputs are numbers, outputs are vectors, which is why our input is an absolute value difference, and the output is a vector or magnitude. Does that make sense? All right, so if you are epsilon close to L, what that means is there is a circle right here that has a radius of epsilon. Well, circle is a good word if you're in two dimensions. What would this object be in three dimensions? Sphere. Sphere. What would it be in four dimensions? A sphere. You just say sphere and it's OK. Well, you can also say ball. That's a very common way to say this, an epsilon ball. These four dimensions with the time variable. So you can think about the time as picking different locations off of your curve. If your time value is close, you'll be somewhere in here. So is this three or four dimensions? Yes. OK. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. It's probably bad to think about it as one dimension, at least two. Two or three are the common ones. So whatever your brain wants between two and three, go for it. Okay. Well, it was, it, it was an either or, <laughs> not, not, not in between. <laughs> So the idea now, if t is close to uh, a, then our function value should be close to l, where close in this case means within a uh, epsilon ball or an epsilon uh, sphere or circle, however you like to think of it. So that is continuity right there.
So another way to think of this So R of t gets very close to some x naught, y naught, z naught value, which we would normally call L. So R of t is approaching this L exactly when each individual function is getting close to these uh, values. So exactly when x of t is approaching x naught, y of t, the y component function, is approaching y naught, and your z function is approaching z naught. So you could individually look at three limits. If I was in two dimensions, I would not have a z coordinate. If I was in four dimensions, I would have another very similar limit right there. So whatever dimension I'm in, it just means all your component functions are getting close to the component values. Okay, so in the last section we went over, you said it would be the best thing for us to know where we were starting from and where we were going with this. Would that help in determining how many limits we should actually take, or do we have to take all three each time we do a problem like this? Depends on what dimension you're in. Okay. So you could treat your limit uh, in n dimensions all at once, or you could take three separate limits and make sure the three component functions approach separately. So it's up to you. Okay. So let's do our first example. We will go with the uh, same function that we graphed. So this one will be exceptionally easy. Find lim t approaches pi over 4. Uh, R of t. And the R of t function we're going to use is the cos t sine t t. So before you get started on this, are these three component functions continuous individually? They're very continuous. They're continuous for all t values, not just close to pi over 4. So any t value these have been continuous for. What can you do with continuous functions and limits? Enter the value into the function. You can basically just plug the value right in. Assuming that they're, as long as they're continuous, you can just plug the value in. So you got a problem if it's not continuous, but individually, we already know these are continuous functions. So I'll just write lim t approaches a f of t equals f of a. So that's the property of continuous functions we're going to use here. That if my t value is approaching a, I can just plug it in. So we'll go ahead and do that right now. So we've got cos pi over 4, sine pi over 4 and pi over 4. And you just need to know these values. 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, and pi over 4. So this limit was super easy because we had a continuous curve. So it was nothing more than plugging in the values. Assuming that it was not continuous for one of them, we would have to take two limits in order to check both sides. Well, that's unfortunately there is six. no, there's not just two sides anymore. There's infinite sides. There's infinite sides. So we can't take two, we can't take six. You have to take infinity. <laughs> Which means you can't take infinity, so you have to do something different. So we'll deal with that very soon. So a curve is continuous at uh, t equals a, 
All right, finish the sentence. A curve is continuous at t equals a exactly when? Do your best to finish that sentence. So it should look just like the continuous definition uh, for regular functions. <coughs> You're just changing the uh, t to an x, and your functions are instead of f. So it's almost the exact same definition. Do we need to memorize these definitions? You should have already memorized these definitions. Okay. I don't. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, you need to know them. <laughs> So how would you be continuous on an entire interval? So you're continuous at every value inside the interval. So exactly when r is continuous for all t in interval i. So that's how you would say you're continuous on an entire interval. You're continuous at every value inside the interval. So if I go back up real quick, your function limits exist exactly when your component limits exist. So turning that into, uh, thinking about that in a continuity, you're continuous when you're, all of your component functions are continuous. So you'll have your limit values when all your component functions have their limit values. So your curve is continuous exactly when all component functions are continuous. So if you're, you know your curve's continuous, then your component functions have to be continuous. And if you know all your component functions are continuous, then your curve has to be continuous. So it's enough to know individually if they're all continuous or if your entire curve is continuous. And you should be somewhat familiar with continuous functions in general. Just that all the trig functions are continuous on their domains. If basically, we're not divided by zero. Rational functions are continuous and all these properties. So what do we do after continuity in calculus one? Derivatives. Derivatives. And after derivatives, we'll do integrals, basically. So let's do derivatives now. How in the world do we get a three-dimensional derivative, or an n-dimensional derivative? How do you compute derivative? You have no idea how to do it. You plug it into f, parentheses x plus h minus f of x over h squared. So use the difference quotient. Take the limit. So that's the definition of derivative. So we're going to use the definition. Is that what I said? That that's what, yeah, that's yeah, what you okay, meant. Okay, okay. So we're going to use uh, the definition. So we start out lim h approach 0 r of, is it OK to add t and h together? Are they the same? Am I doing a number plus a vector? Or are these both numbers, both vectors? Yes. 
can you nature numbers? So it's okay to add them together. So I want to make sure, just because you write, for example, if I wrote r of t plus h, that's wrong in two ways. One, it's not the difference quotient, and two, you can't add a vector and a number together. So it's double wrong now if you do this. So those days should be behind you. And if we do, you'll give us negative points. I'll probably stop grading if you do that, because anything, if you're going to subtract a number from a vector, whatever you write after that <laughs> doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> All right, so that's yeah. super familiar, hopefully. The only difference is before you had uh, Fs instead of Rs and Xs instead of Ts. So it's exactly the same. And this, of course, is R prime. That's one way to write it, R prime of T. Another way, which variable are we taking a derivative with respect to? If I use, D. yep, it'll be D DT. So however you want to write it, R prime or D DT of R of T. So that's how we're going to compute our derivative. Let's break this down a little bit further. What type of objects are in the numerator? We're subtracting two vectors. So we know that subtracting two vectors, you're basically subtracting the corresponding coordinates together. So I could rewrite it with its coordinate functions in place of the r. So if I write it with coordinate functions, I have x of t plus h, comma, y of t plus h, z of t plus h, minus x of t, y of t, z of t. And subtracting vectors, you're basically doing it one coordinate at a time. That's how you subtract vectors. So if we do the subtraction, we're going to get x t plus h minus x of t. That's our first coordinate. y of t plus h minus y of t. That's our y coordinate. And z t plus h minus z of t is our z coordinate. So any questions about that regrouping the way we subtract? That's just the vector. That's just how you subtract vectors. Nothing too fancy going on right there. Uh, there is a reason we're doing this. So we got one vector divided by a scalar. So I could rewrite it as each component divided by the scalar. This is the scalar property, where I'm basically distributing 1 over h to each component. Yep. Oh. I think we still have a minute or two. So still have yet to do any actual calculus. That was all algebra, vector algebra right there. So with these limits, you can basically distribute the limit to each component function. So I can distribute the limit inside here. So this is about to get a whole lot better. What is another name for the first coordinate? It's a derivative x of t. 
So we can write as x prime of t. And now, it should be pretty clear what the next coordinate is. That's y prime of t right there. And last up, z prime of t. All right, so that was a lot of work just to show how to compute the derivative. So that's probably what you expected, or at least what you were hoping would come out. So is that the this is how you take a derivative. You take a derivative of the individual functions, and the reason that it works is this. Oh, I was looking up here. I was like, are we going to plug in 5 or 4? If, okay. if, but yeah, for, if I give you an example problem, absolutely. <laughs> like, so we'll compute derivatives and take a quiz tomorrow. <laughs>